Well, thank you, Philip. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to uh, give this talk. It's not uh, regular that I give. I go to a conference and give a non-specialist uh, talk. I usually talk to my own kind. Um, so um, uh, forgive me if, uh, if I've pitched this the right or the wrong way. I, I hope it's a mix of technical and problematic. Uh, just, I'll put, put my cards on the table. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I guess you would say a mechanical engineer. <laughs> Uh, I don't think of myself as the type of engineer that builds geothermal plants, for example, but I do consider myself the type of engineer who pretends to be uh, an applied mathematician and a physicist every now and then, but I'm primarily an experimental person. Uh, so firstly, I'd just like to say I I'm just going to talk about the role for hydrogen in large-scale power generation, and I'm using power generation in a loose-handed sense, but basically we're talking about really large-scale, and I'll, I will demonstrate what I mean by that. Uh, I, I have a bunch of collaborators. Uh, the important thing is, uh, is that, uh, as someone said earlier, uh, this isn't a one university effort. In this case, this is a sort of people that are uh, within my group. But uh, we also work with major companies, and Saldo Energia, which used to be Alstom uh, in uh, Switzerland, but was taken over by, by GE, and uh, Siemens as well. Uh, and we work with computational theory, uh, all, all the stuff. Um, and so what I just want to say on the front here, we have a very elaborate picture. You're not supposed to be able to make sense of it. It's just supposed to look cool. Uh, it's a, what we call a direct numerical simulation of a reheat combustor. So this is solving the full Navier-Stokes equations with full chemistry. It has all kinds of wonderful physics in it. Okay, and the red bit is like the flame. Uh, and, and this is more what I do. I make things hot in the lab and then try to explain things like that, which is uh, tricky. Um, I'm just going to whip through this. This is what I'm going to talk about today. Just a little bit about uh, why hydrogen fuels seem to be uh, coming back into fashion again, if you like. Uh, the importance of scale. Uh, this is, of course, uh, all engineers should know this. Scaling is, is our thing, right? Uh, also for uh, physicists, too, of course. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about specific technical and scientific challenges of combustion. And they're kind of related, but they're also separate, right? So one's development, and that's an industry-driven process trial and error. The other one is like the fundamentals of what a flame does when you put it in a box, okay? Um, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try to convince you that what I, I think are the best concepts for moving towards pure hydrogen combustion. So we, we fully decarbonize. Uh, and and uh, yes, and we'll continue. So um, uh, basically this is uh, what I would call the, the value chain, although, again, I'm not really a fan of the concepts of value chains. Uh, I'm more interested in what goes on in each of these boxes. But in each of these boxes, what we're, this is, if you like, my set of assumptions, okay? So one is I'm going to assume that we can produce hydrogen from natural gas using steam reforming in very large quantities, and we can uh, sequester it. Okay, without that, the, the whole deal is off. So that's uh, the importance of, of CCS, I think, for decarbonizing is uh, unquestioned, at least if we plan to use fossil fuels. Uh, then we need a hydrogen carrier, of course. Uh, both of these are uh, used uh, or made, right? And there's transport pipelines, boats, various different things. But I'm going to focus on this stuff. Uh, I'm not going to talk about green H2 from renewables because although it's important and will undoubtedly become more important over time, it's just not there in scale. An, ele an electrolyzer cannot produce enough hydrogen uh, compared to steam reforming, at least yet, anyway. Um, <clears throat> we have two realistic fuel sources. So what we're really talking about are high hydrogen fuels, okay? So fuels that may be blends of hydrogen and methane, but we're talking about moving towards all hydrogen or very small amounts of methane to basically kill, uh, reduce or get rid of CO2 emissions. Uh, ammonia uh, isn't been considered, at least in Norway where they make a lot of it, hasn't been considered a fuel source. Actually, it's quite a good fuel source, uh, or it could be a good fuel source, and it's one of the things we should investigate. It also overcomes some of the transport hiccups of pressurizing and transporting liquid hydrogen, and it creates other problems. Uh, but that's what engineers do, we solve problems. Uh, the advantage of ammonia is, of course, there's an energy cost to convert hydrogen to uh, natural gas to ammonia from the Haber-Bosch process. Uh, but it's a well-known carbon capture method. So, uh, in fact, most of your fizzy drinks will have CO2 produced by an ammonia factory. Um, 
But what I really want to talk about is this. Large-scale power generation, really we're talking about 500 megawatts per installed integrated combined cycle gas turbine, right? So very large quantities of power. Large quantities of power means large CO2 <coughs> savings. And I think this is where we need to be bold and where we need to go. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about projects that I'm working on with companies that are trying to push in this direction, and this uh, including oil and gas companies, but also manufacturers. Okay, so uh, why use hydrogen? Uh, one, it's, it's a technically viable route to large-scale decarbonization, right? For, and it can be for heat as well, all right? Um, it's not proven uh, totally, but it's on the way. Um, we can already do this first part, uh, and that is we can reduce CO2 emissions using blends uh, at low levels of hydrogen. We, you can already put it into existing combustor hardware, but there are some costs for that. One is you might have to derate the engine, which means if you buy an engine for 50 megawatts, it might only run at 40 megawatts or something like that. Uh, but these are the things that the market cares about less than, less than me. Uh, but it, it can already be done, uh, but at fa fairly modest levels. But the real goal here is, of course, is getting to what I would call zero CO2 emissions, which basically means we, we, take, we convert all of the methane fuel streams and we turn them into hydrogen fuel streams and we sequester the CO2. Um, and I, I don't know anything about CCS, so I'm going to presume that the geologists and the chemical engineers uh, know enough about that. Um, uh, another advantage, of course, for gas turbines it deals with this prickly storage issue with renewables. So renewables don't like, well, they, they, you can't control their loading. Uh, and uh, with these so-called like power to X to power, or power to gas to power, it allows you to form a stable backup grid. It allows, it allows you to have more wind turbines, more solar things, uh, solar plants, not things. Uh, and, um, and basically as a, a kind of background power source. And uh, finally, of course, it's probably our most efficient way to make electricity by quite a long way, especially in a combined cycle form. Not all applications need that in industry, but in terms of large-scale power generation, uh, you're getting up to 60, 62 uh, percent efficiency, right? So there's really no other thermal power plant that can match it. Okay, so now this is just, I'm presuming most of you don't know anything about gas turbines, which is perfectly fine. I just wanted to give you an idea of this is what, if you were in an industry and you needed to buy, uh, let's say you work in Equinor and you need to power your uh, offshore platform, this is the list of products you're going to look at to do it, right? And what you can see is we move from a handful of megawatts, right, all the way up to 567 megawatts. So these large scale, what they call heavy duty gas turbines, the one in red, these are what you'd buy for a power plant, right? One or two of these things. Okay, They're, and uh, they look like this inside. They're massively technical devices, right? There's a huge amount of engineering and science that goes into making these things, uh, and uh, they're amazingly uh, compact, and they're also very quick to deploy, and uh, they're also uh, very well maintained, okay? Um, and it's basically a high technology industry. It's the same type of industry that runs the aero engines, except the aero engines have different safety limits, but a lot of the problems in these are the same as the problems you get in aero engines. So in other words, if you solve one problem, it probably knocks into the next, uh, the next technology. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about work that we're doing at this level, which is the type of level we'd put on a, you'd put on a offshore platform. But I'm really interested in this because this is where you're going to reduce CO2. If you can get rid of all the oil and coal and install a combined cycle running on pure hydrogen, you're going to save a lot of CO2. I haven't done the calculations in terms of megatons of CO2, but uh, you could probably work it out fairly easily. Okay, now I just want to talk a little bit about scale, and I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, I don't, you don't really need to look at this engine, but this is the SGT 800. It's about a 50 megawatt engine. This is running at 50. They, they did an hour sector test, so that. That's a full test running the engine at full tilt for one hour, right? And here's how much hydrogen you need to do that, okay? In each of these is 1.4 tons of hydrogen, okay? This is just to give you an idea of the sheer volume of hydrogen you need to run a gas turbine only at 50 megawatts. So if we're going to 500 megawatts, you need to produce lots of hydrogen, okay? So we're talking serious amounts. 
Uh, and uh, this was just one hour test and uh, it was very successful. And uh, so now they're offering selling these engines, the SGT 800 and 600s at uh, 50 to 60% volume, which is a little bit of hand wavy trickery, I'll tell you about in a second, because the real one you want to know about is what it is by mass. So uh, by volume is actually a small amount of hydrogen overall. So you need even more than what was in those containers. But uh, here's a bigger engine. Uh, this is a 500 megawatt big beast, right? So this is large scale power generation gas turbine. And this is just to give you again, a, f a fuel. One of these things produces more electricity than the entire installed fuel cell capacity in 2000, as of 2017, okay? Uh, more than the Topaz Solar Farm in California, which everybody should be familiar because they have very nice pictures that everybody puts on their PowerPoint presentations. Uh, and uh, for some of us who are in the Norwegian dimension, it's greater than the combined capacity of these three different wind farms that are planned, uh, and which are basically the important figure is, oh, is 150 turbines with 120 meter wingspan or span of each blade. Okay, so the, the message is these things are big, but they're compact and they are powered, their power density is unmatched, right? Okay, so uh, the more interesting things are, is this. So I'm more interested in how to make the, how to burn hydrogen, and burning hydrogen has some very special challenges compared to natural gas. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get used to uh, this here. So the first is it has a very high flame speed. So uh, the way we characterize mixtures in combustion is that we take a, a fuel with a certain mixture and then it, it has properties, like one is ignition, temperatures, ignition pressures. It's sensitive to a bunch of state variables. We have to map those out. Uh, but it also propagates. So if you have a premixed box of air and fuel that's all at a given stoichiometry, so there's an air-fuel mixture in there of a fixed number, the flame will propagate across that box at a fixed speed. Now, as it happens, methane will propagate across that box at about uh, 35 to 40 meters per section, uh, per 35 to 40 meters per second at, at peak mixture, so at a, just a slightly rich equivalence ratio. Now, if we add 50% hydrogen to that, we get up to 55, 60 centimeters per second. That's okay, that's still fast, but we can handle that. When we go up, and this is by volume, so it's not a lot of hydrogen, okay? If you get up to a mixture of 30, 70, so 30% natural gas, 70% hydrogen, we're at 107, over 170 centimeters per second, okay? And then if we're where we really want to be, even higher than this, but let's say 90% hydrogen, we're up at near the speed of sound, okay? So these are very fast flames. And this is what is the problem with trying to get this to burn in a real gas turbine, okay? So uh, another thing it is, is hydrogen likes to burn, so it's very di it, it has very wide flammability limits. So if you light a hydrogen flame, and as long as it's, you can hold it, uh, it's very hard to put it out. Uh, it, it just burns, um, which is good, but also creates other challenges to the system. Uh, it has a low ignition energy, which sounds good, but also creates other problems. So in other words, if you put it under pressure and you heat it up, it ignites faster than methane. So that's good if you, as long as you know where, where that sits. Okay, so if you don't know how hydrogen behaves under pressure and temperature, then we have a little bit of an issue. And in fact, we, we don't have sufficient information about that, which is one of the areas we really need to uh, do more research in. Um, and because it has a, a low ignition energy, it also has a thing called a short ignition delay time. And the best way to think about that is you just have a box of a hydrogen mixture, hydrogen air, and if you uh, have it at a given pressure and then you heat up that box slowly, then you heat it up until it ignites and that gives you the ignition time for that uh, mixture. And you can do that uh, uh, in a fundamental rapid compression machine or a kind of what we call a bomb colloquially. Uh, it's not really a bomb, but it, it does what a bomb does. Uh, and, uh, and then we measure how fast the flame propagates out. Uh, but the reason why we need this is because the chemists need to have this data so they can build the chemical models so that we don't have to do these tests all the time. And we need the chemical models to know what the Arrhenius kinetics are and what the dependency of pressure and temperature is with hydrogen mixtures. And we don't have a full set of that. 
And uh, so this is our challenge. We have a bunch of hydrogen-rich blends from zero to 100% hydrogen. It leads to something called flashback, which I guess you'd have some intuitive knowledge about. So that's if you have a flame, like a Bunsen flame, like you would have seen at school, uh, a flashback would be the flame propagating back into the Bunsen tube. And when that happens, that destroys the engine, okay? So uh, one of the main functions of engines, apart from burning stuff in a small volume, is you want to keep the burning stuff in the same place as long, for all conditions. So, um, yeah, and combustion instabilities. And I'm going to show you a little bit about this today. The other thing that happens when you have a flame in a box is it excites all the musical notes of the box. And that creates large-scale pressure fluctuations, and these pressure fluctuations then can cause mechanical failure, basically, mm -hmm. through very elaborate uh, mechanisms. Okay, so I think I whipped through that part quite quickly and I've eaten up a good chunk of the, of, of the time. But uh, the technical challenges, so if you talk to industry, so a gas turbine manufacturer, this is what they say, we want to maintain low NOx. Uh, so this is, you know, before we started talking about CO2, no one talks about CO2 and combustion, right? If you get CO2 and you get a lot, you get the maximum amount of CO2, that means you're thermally efficient because you have to convert all your fuel to CO2 and water ultimately. Um, but low NOx is a thing that is very important, and we're here sub TPM, we're usually sub 10 ppm at 15% oxygen, which basically is good. Um, and uh, combustor stability, so we want to be able to keep the flame in the right place, we want the combustor to burn everything, and we don't want it to do something funny, okay? Uh, we don't want to derate the engine, so a company is trying to provide a product, so they don't want to derate the engine in any way. Uh, and they also want to make it more dynamic. So they want to be able to shift powers, run at par partial loads, things like this, and maintain all of these things at the same time. And all of these basically tie back to the fundamentals understanding of how hydrogen burns in the first place. So you can't do those things entirely well without understanding the basic physics of the problem. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit now quickly so this is a slide from our colleagues at Siemens. Basically, this is what they offer. They're conventional engines as it is, and they've already been testing up to this much hydrogen per volume. And so there's been no radical design of the combustion chamber, okay? This is what you call a, a dry low emission or low NOx burner. And that approach is one approach. This approach is most likely not going to work with pure hydrogen. It will probably flash back, so the flame won't stay in the right place. And this is where they've tested. And you can bet above some point here, it flashed back. So that's where they stop, right? Uh, and Zalda, which produce only large scale engines. So they only produce in the high megawatt range. We're talking above 300 megawatts, OK? They don't have smaller engines like Siemens. Uh, do something a bit different. So they, they have, uh, rather than having a flame in one stage, just like one combustion can, they actually have a staged combustion, proce uh, staged combustion process. So what they do here is they have a pilot flame, a first stage where they burn, and then they preheat all this air, and then they dump extra fuel in here and get a second stage. And if, for those of you who know thermodynamics, this is a way to increase the work output. But essentially, it creates a different type of flame, which is a different combustor strategy. And this is an important thing. I can't get into, because I could talk a whole talk about that, but uh, that could be a key to running pure hydrogen. Uh, what it basically means is they can tune the second stage where they put the most power and they can tune it to the ignition characteristics of the fuel, which is ideal. So it means if hydrogen is extra fast, they should be able to, within reason, try to tune it to operate with hydrogen. And so they've recently demonstrated 50% hydrogen. That's at full 500 megawatts, by the way. So this is a huge demonstration. Uh, so that's 500 by volume in, without derating the engine. OK, so we have a couple of things that we need to know. One is fundamental research. We need to know these things about combustion properties, the effect of pressure and temperature <laughs> on flame speed, ignition delay, all these flame things, uh, the fundamental physics of the problem. The technical bit is we need to know how the different geometries can handle the flames and whether they work or not. Now, I'm going to show you some flames. So combustion instabilities work like this. Here's a hydrogen flame. We're going to try to. Press play on this. Now it's going to go invisible, okay? And that's what a hydrogen flame looks like because you can't, there's no carbon. 
so we don't see it basically. Most of the light you see from a flame is CH in, a, in one of the chemical steps. And uh, I'll just go back so it doesn't play again. <laughs> Uh, but here we just added 5% of methane to a pure hydrogen flame just so you could see it, okay? So that just gives you an idea of what it looks like, okay? You can also hear that it was a bit noisy, a bit pitchy, okay? Yeah, that's, it's on the cusp of an instability, and, and here's what that, that sounds like. So that's actually exciting the note of the geometry in here, and this is what you don't want in an engine. Okay, so now I'm going to do, tell you all the things that we don't want in engines because that's the bit I like to do research on. Okay, so uh, but uh, this this is basically a coupling between the acoustics and the flame, uh, and it's it's it happens in normal engines with methane as well. So it's not it's not like a showstopper or anything, but we need to know about it and how it works with hydrogen. Um, here's an uh, oh yeah, so. Now, what I do is we do, these measure we, we do these experiments and then we take these very fancy measurements using uh, laser diagnostics, high-speed imaging, uh, and then we analyze the flame. The heat release in time, if you, could, if you had eyes that could look at this fast enough, you would see that the, the flame is actually flapping up and down like this at a frequency of about 785 hertz. Not good. Okay. This also implies that there's pressure fluctuations going up and down, and this creates mechanical vibrations in the engine, which causes it to fail. Um, another effect of adding hydrogen, which is neither good nor bad, but uh, something we need to know. This is a pure methane uh, flame here, so there's no hydrogen addition. They're quite big. They have big luminous regions, okay? And then as we add hydrogen 5% by power, so that's it's by, almost by mass, but rated with dense, but weighted by density, okay? So 5, 10, 15, 20, et cetera. What you can see is the flame shape changes, and then at 23% uh, to 25%, the flame shape changes quite suddenly, okay? So it goes from these big outer regions to a more compact squat flame. And in fact, if you run the flame close to pure hydrogen, it just shrinks down to like a little, seam of hydrogen. It's amazing. And, uh, but uh, it also goes self-excited <laughs> at different things. So we need to map when these um, changes. So if you change from 27% to 28%, we get a massive change in the thermoacoustic behavior, which is uh, shown by this. Now, this is just changing 1% from here, and then it'll go slightly insane. Okay, so we need to know a lot more about the fundamentals of hydrogen combustion to be able to deal with that stuff. <laughs> That's not meant to scare you, but it's just meant to point out that I could do that with methane as well, but it wouldn't be so sensitive. Uh, uh, okay, so my final remarks, which I think brings me in a little bit late, uh, or a little bit, little bit later than I should be. Um, we can burn hydrogen-rich fuels in combustors. Uh, you can buy uh, certain engines co-firing with small amounts of hydrogen by volume already, and that's because there's been a push to decarbonize, of course. So that can already reduce CO2 emissions by a lot. But of course, the real goal here has got to be going to pure hydrogen or pretty darn close to it. And uh, there are significant but exciting challenges with this. Um, and uh, we have some projects working with Statoil. You could do this with ammonia as well and try to slow the flame down. That's another strategy, but I don't have time to talk about that today. Um, but essentially, the message I'd like to say is this. So we can replace, it's entirely within our realm of possibility, replace methane with hydrogen in real engines. Okay, there's going to be some uh, difficulties, but uh, th these can be overcome. But um, if you're an oil and gas company and you're waiting for a gas turbine company to make a pure hydrogen engine, you're going to be waiting forever, right? And the reason is, is it's a high technology industry and the development cost of an engine is huge, right? It's like basically all of their profit in a year. Uh, they haven't got wads of cash in the bank like the oil and gas industry does. So there needs to be a good development, a co-development between uh, all stakeholders in the, in the so-called value chain. And I think if that happens, it can, it can happen. And we can actually decarbonize a huge amount of our power generation 
probably within a five to 10 year time horizon. Okay, and that's it, thank you. Thank you. I think we take that literally. Thank you for listening. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, think I think it's important you hear what it sounds like uh, because, yeah. You, you all heard hydrogen combustion for the first time in yeah. this room, I imagine. <laughs> uh, James, great presentation, thanks. Could you talk a little bit about transportation? I mean, would you need to take the gas to the plant and then reform it, or would you do it wherever the gas comes in and then transport, transport the hydrogen? Yeah. What's simpler? Um, okay, I'm not, I'm not sh I, I think there, there's not one general solution for this. I think something like the H21 project has some examples. I mean, the amount of hydrogen you need probably means you're going to have to make the hydrogen at source or put the reforming plants near large caverns and uh, natural places where you can store hydrogen underground or something like that. Um, and so I think that, uh, and there's lots of place, places like that in a lot of countries, but it, it's a bit of a logistical uh, exercise. But um, yeah, I think that's the simplest way to answer your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Is there another one over here too? I suppose it's a related question really. Um, I guess we're thinking about the geoscience of this, you know, sure. what, what it means to us as yeah. geoscientists. And I guess most of us think that it's a given that we're going to need to store hydrogen because it's it, to, to do it on any scale, you need to move large amounts yeah. around. Well, that's and great for us. For us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other given is that it has to be done in the underground, yeah. hence it involves us. But And the, th the third given is that it has to be salt. Okay. Um, but I guess there are other questions as well. I mean, do you think that it is a given that we need to store a lot of hydrogen, first of all? And do you think, with your knowledge of the chemistry of the molecule that we are talking about only underground storage and what what do you think the the kind of implications are for geology uh, of storage or is that going too far for um, uh, maybe too far but i can try to offer some some answer i think um i'm i'm not a a transport person so but uh, i i would i would imagine that there are uh, as I said the first time, a variety of solutions. It might make sense in some instances to reform the hydrogen on site if you could reform it at a rate fast enough to feed whatever rating your, your power plant's running at. My sort of fear at the moment is that I don't really have a handle on if you're really going to run uh, a half a terawatt gas turbine, can you produce enough hydrogen to do that? Um, I mean, you can, but can you produce it like in a continuous stream? I think that's, that's an interesting question. I'm sure it's perfectly solvable, but it turns into, I think it moves more towards the logistics and the, and the geoscience side. Um, yeah, and I, I haven't got any particular advice for that, uh, but yeah, I think this is something that needs to be thought about. But I think some of it might be coming in the next talk. Okay. Just, yeah. just to ask, add one thing, I, I guess that what I'm thinking of is that salt severely limits where we can store, because we don't have salt everywhere. And I guess the question is, can you store hydrogen in, in salt aquifers, plant. for example, in sandstones. And I know that there are people thinking about this, but I think we have to think about it more because otherwise the storage thing will cause problems for the ge geography of hydrogen. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure what happens to the hydrogen after you've stored it in a, an aquifer either. We three, need three more comments. Yeah. A quick question. Is the sure. burn temperature different in a power plant? And if so, do you have a different cooling requirement with implications for water resources and things? Oh, okay. Uh, that's really moving to operational side of engineering. Uh, um, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the temperature, like uh, the Carnot efficiency of the cycle, if you like, um, is of a hydrogen plant is not really that much different from what I can recall. But it depends on how you're running it as well, right? Um, the cooling aspect is a challenge, but I don't think in terms of water. I think it's more in terms of the combustor cooling. So like the exhaust gas temperature won't be wildly different. And anyway, we would use that in a combined cycle uh, to produce uh, steam. So um, uh, yeah, I don't know in terms of a uh, plant operation, but uh, I would say that it, like in terms of the combustor operation, it, it's, it, it's not over and above what we're using already. We might have to just do things a little bit differently. It's not the heat transfer, that's a big problem, really. Three more? Uh, Mike, or is it two? 
question to which you might not know. You talked about a lot of hydrogen. Uh, of ammonia then yes. works in internal combustion engines. As yes. Far as I can yes. How far away are you from ammonia in turbines? Oh, okay. So uh, we actually have a project that we're working with Equinor on. Um, and uh, one of the things I was trying to touch on, but uh, maybe is a bit subtle, is that um, this stage combustion process might work quite well with pure hydrogen, but uh, these uh, single stage combustors, probably not. Um, however, that's trying to burn hydrogen in all its glory and at, at all its speed. <laughs> uh, but with ammonia, you can, you can do some interesting things. So it, our project is concerned with trying to make an ammonia-hydrogen-nitrogen mixture that actually mimics the flame properties of methane. So that basically use the existing uh, hardware of, a, of an engine. And um, you can use the waste heat coming from the gas turbine, which is at about 400 C, to crack, uh, to crack the ammonia and then come up with the right mixture. The thing we are not sure about is where the NOx goes. Uh, but ammonia, uh, coincidentally, is also uh, used to, uh, for flu gas treatment to clean up NOx and, and sulfur dioxide and other things like that. So we think that there is some reducing mechanism, some sweet spot there, and where that's part of our research, actually, is trying to make it like methane without any carbon in it. Yeah. But does that mean basically controlling the oxygen mix input really precisely then, so you've got the right stoichiometry for reducing the NOx output? Uh, it's not the oxygen that's so much of a problem. We can control that part because it comes from air, so it, basically. It, it's, really the, it, it's really the hydrogen, nitrogen, ammonia blend uh, uh, that, that needs to be done. And unfortunately, we do also don't have the chemical mechanisms for burning that. So we're also working, I'm not because I'm not a chemist, but we're, we're also working on that. So um, there's a lot of unknowns with these things because no one's asked before to burn them. Uh, in this way. So, uh, but we think that ammonia is quite likely a good option in a lot of cases, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last comment from the floor. John Brenda, could you um, speculate on how um, the knowledge you've got um, would lead to the possibility of hydrogen going into the natural gas distribution of pipeline systems and into my domestic... Yeah. Pipeline. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, my understanding... <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is that, uh, you know, hydrogen is a pretty small element and, and, and can walk through steel walls, I think. Uh, so um, I think, the, I think again, I think the H21 project is sort of predicated on a refurbishment of the Victorian pipelines from uh, uh, lead, or I guess they're all lead, I guess, then, uh, to uh, sewer plastic, right? or iron even, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, putting, putting it into existing gas pipelines, I don't think you can. Uh, maybe as a gas. Now, for the liquefied compressed hydrogen, I don't know. But I know that there's problems with embrittlement and various other issues with the pipelines. It sounds like a bit of a nightmare, uh, to be honest, because I think they're not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, no, absolutely. I, I don't know how much. I thought it was about 50 to 60 percent hydrogen by mass. Now, I don't know if the problem is putting pure hydrogen down a pipe or, yeah, I, uh, well, I it's uh, blending, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I honestly don't know. I would imagine that if you just come up with a town gas mixture, that it would probably be okay. But I think the, they're thinking other things with uh, hydrogen. Yeah. Again, I think I think we're going to move.